Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. My name is Father Anthony Gramlich. I'm the Assistant Rector of the National Shrine and here to give the Saturday talk today. And first, let's begin with a prayer asking for God's guidance, the guidance of the Holy Spirit to be upon us today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today. We ask you, send forth your Holy Spirit upon us. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. Lord God, we ask for your grace today. We ask for the intercession of the Blessed Mother, all the angels and saints to help us to understand your word and to put it into practice in our lives. And we ask this all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So the topic of our talk today is how to live holiness in a secularized society. So this is, it's kind of a hard talk, you know, because how do you live holiness in a secularized society? It's pretty difficult. It's not easy. And secularized society, we all live in secularized society. So I'm going to be given a few points about secularized society. And if you say, well, Father, you, you missed this and you missed that. Well, th there's so much about secularized society. We all live in secularized society. So we, we kind of have an idea of what secularized society is like. But I'd like to give you maybe some of the philosophy behind secularized society. So every age has its bad and its good, its strengths and its weaknesses. If you think about you know, the history of the world, every age has had, has had challenges, has had, cha you know, like Moses had a challenge to, to free the people, to free the, the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt. And it wasn't an easy challenge in his life. And then after he freed the people, he was with these people for 40 years in the desert where they were complaining and grumbling. So it, it wasn't easy for Moses. But there, there have been saints that lived holy lives in the midst of their society. I, Mention Moses being one. Uh, you think of the age of paganism and the early church. There was St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Justin Martyr. You think of the Virgin Saint, St. Agnes, who died when she was 12 years old. So you don't, you don't need to be an adult to respond to the age. You could even be an, a child, an adolescent, and be holy and be a saint. St. Lawrence, where St. Lawrence was put on a grill. If you think about the 20th century, St. Maximilian Kolbe, where he's in the death camps of Auschwitz and he gives up his life for a fellow prisoner. You think of St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I always call her Mother Teresa. I always have to put that Mother Teresa in there. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, think of what she did to the poor people on the streets, the destitute, and, and how she helped and how she formed a religious community that still works with the destitute and the poor of the world. You think of St. John Paul II and how he responded to our society or the many martyrs of World War II communism, and even the many martyrs of today, of how they're responding to culture, or say to terrorism itself. So in every generation, God has raised up saints who lived holy lives in their midst of their culture and their society. And my belief is that even and our society, our day, even in the Western culture, that God will and is raising up saints. One of you might be a saint. Who knows? I could be talking to saints out here, people watching on the live stream. 
you can become a saint. So anyone can become a saint. So first thing is we have to maybe understand a little bit of the philosophy of our secularized society. And I'm just going to relate some characteristics of our secularized society. It's, it's not all exhaustive. I know I'm going to be missing elements and I could be here for two, three hours just giving elements of our secularized society. But some of the, some of the elements, the underlying elements that maybe you don't see, sometimes we see the fruits of those underlying philosophies, but we don't understand what is the underlying philosophy of some of our secularized society today. So the first, uh, as you can see on the slide, is narcissism. Narcissism. Narcissism is a focus on the self without concern for others. That they used to use this ancient image of Narcissus, where he's looking at a pool of reflection of himself, and he's consumed with his self. He's consumed with self. It's all about the self. It's all about the world revolves around me. And when you live that kind of selfish life, where everyone has to beckon at your call, where you begin to control others, that's a narcissist, classic sign of narcissism, and we can feel isolated from others, that, that maybe we lack a sense of community because we're only focused on ourselves. And it can be very dangerous when it's, when it's gone to excess. I'm not saying don't ever focus on yourself. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there, there's an excessiveness in our culture where we're overly focused on ourselves. Like how many people just focus on their outside image. You know, what does my hair li look like? You know, how my nails look, how my eyebrows, my ears, this, that. And we're so focused on our body. And you know what, I, I, I always have a, a funny expression that when we're dead, when we're dead in the casket, people are gonna say, oh, doesn't she look so good? Doesn't she look so good? You know, she died in her whole life and she did her hair. And doesn't she look so good? She's dead. You see that? So we have to put things in reality. We can't over focus on this. That means that we don't, that means that we don't take care of ourselves. Yes, we take care of ourselves. That means, yeah, brush your teeth. Yeah, comb my hair. If I didn't comb my hair, if my hair was sticking up, everyone would be saying, Father Anthony, you need to comb your hair. Or if I had dirt on my face, he said, you need to take a shower. There's hygiene, that's good. So I'm not saying don't take care of yourself. I'm just saying there's an over excessiveness of focus on self. You see that? So when there's over, when you go over something, and that's characteristics of our culture is excess, then you're in vice. So they, so they always teach a moral principle that virtue is the midway between excess and deficiency. If you have a deficiency in something, then you're falling into a vice. It's going to hurt yourself. It's going to hurt others. On the other hand, if you fall into excess of something, you're also falling into vice that's going to hurt yourself and hurt your relationship with others. In our culture, a lot of it's about excess. It's about excess. And that's why people are falling into vices, because it's, it's, it's over. It's too much of what we need. So that's the first characteristic, is narcissism. Second characteristic is what's called relativism. You ever hear of relativism? Relativism means that there's no objective truth. So truth is not objective. Truth is not outside of you. A truth is subjective. It is what I want it to be. So I define my own truth. 
And not only do I define my own truth, a truth that maybe I defined, say, 10 years ago, truth evolves. There's an evolution of truth. It changes with the culture. So what we said maybe 10 years ago doesn't apply to today. It could change today. And it could change tomorrow. See how dangerous that is? So when you have truth that's it's part of evolutionary theory, where truth evolves, when this truth evolves, then you have everyone giving their own truth. Brother Mark is going to put a funny slide up. You can't see it. It's, it's a slide of an elephant. And everyone is pointing at the elephant. And they're all saying what they think the elephant is. So some are saying, you know, it's a spear, it's a snake, it's this. Everyone is defining what this elephant is. But we all know what an elephant is. How do we know enough? Well, it's got the, you know, the big trunk and it's, it's big and it's, you know, and it, it picks up things with the trunk and it eats peanuts and, you know, branches and all kinds of stuff. And it's big. That's, we call it an elephant. But in relativism, you can call an elephant whatever you want. It doesn't have to be an elephant. You see that? So it's, it's very dangerous when you have subjective truth and people defining their own truth and defining things of what they think it should be. You see that? It's very dangerous then to go objective and say, oh, you know, this is what it means. So objective truth is what God wants us to have. So morality is based on nature, not self. You become very selfish when your morality is based on yourself. So there, there are moral principles that are outside ourselves that no matter what we think, that we have to follow those principles, their physical laws, principles, and if you don't follow them, you're, it's going to hurt you. So, for instance, the law of gravity. Do you know the law of gravity? So I'm on the third floor in this building, and if I were to walk out of my window and say, I don't believe in the law of gravity because I'm defining my own truth. And so I walk out and I say, law of gravity, you don't exist for me. I define my own truth. And I walk off the roof, what's going to happen? Gravity will pull me down and I'll break my leg or my neck. I'll hurt myself because I'm trying to define a law that's already outside of me, that's already defined, the law of gravity. If I don't follow the law of gravity, then I will hurt myself. It's a law that's already based on nature. So nature is already built in to our laws, to our system. Even in animals, you have nature that's built and to animals and determines its purpose. So for example, on the, on the slide here, you'll see a bee. And you ever ask this question, like we have a lot of bees on the property here, which is great because you know, bees are, some of the bees are going into extinction and it's great. I love just watching the bees. And uh, I'll even ask the bee, how do you know how to fly? I'll look at the bee and say, how do you know how to fly? Who taught you how to fly? And if you know anything about the aerodynamics of a bee, its body is heavier than its wings. And it baffles scientists, how can a bee fly when its body is heavier than its wings? How does a bee know to gather nectar? Who told the bee to gather nectar? Who told the bee to go from flower to flower to pollinate and gather nectar? How does the bee know how to make honey? Who taught that bee? Did the bee go to bee class and learn how to be a bee when it was born? No. 
It has a built-in nature inside itself that when it's, when it's born as a bee, it has this built-in nature that has the characteristics of a bee. It cannot be anything but a bee. So bees know its reason for existence. Its reason for existence is to gather nectar and make honey. That is a bee's reason for existence. I know I'm going into philosophy. This is Aristotelian philosophy, Aristotle. But it's very important because our society goes against this. They go against nature itself. So if things are built into nature, into the laws of the universe and animals, then what about human beings? Doesn't a human being have a built-in nature which gives us our reason for existence? And if we go against that nature that is natural law, then we are not fulfilling our reason for existence and will hurt ourselves and others in the process. So we have certain functions as human beings that you have to follow. Like you, you need to eat every day. If you don't eat, you will starve. You need to sleep every day. You need to work. See, there, there are natural things and there are supernatural things also built into our existence because human beings are not just material. This is part of our secular society that we think that we're just material, but we also have a soul. We also have an inner being, a spirit, a soul within inside of us. So we're not only material beings, we're also material and spiritual at the same time. And this is something that goes right against the culture. Because the culture just wants to think that we're only material. That's only the here and now. What you see, what you can sense with your five senses. That's the most important. And yet, we have the spiritual dimension for us where we're, where we're longing for something spiritual, for something metaphysical. So I'll give you an example. Love. We all long for love. But show me love. Show me love. Point to it. Point to love. Point to love. Show me love. And it's, you can't show me it. You can show me examples of love, but you can't show me love as it is itself. See, it's something spiritual. It's something beyond us. So there are metaphysical virtues and principles and realities that are beyond us that we recognize that we can't sense with our five senses, yet we desire. We desire those metaphysical principles. Hope. We desire hope, but show me hope. Show me it. Where is hope? It's a, you, you can't really show me it. You can only show me examples of hope, but it's something that's, be, see, it's something that's beyond the physical. That's what we say when we say metaphysical. It's beyond the physical world. So now, other characteristics of our secularized society. That could be a whole talk on itself, just, just that talk. Materialism, or what we call consumerism. So the desire, the excessive desire for money, as you see on the slide here, what we call greed. Greed. You, you ever think of this with this desire for money, that once we had millionaires, you ever play Monopoly? Like you wanna be a millionaire, you wanna control everything, you wanna you know, control boardwalk and everything and tax everyone and own everything and have all this excessive wealth and money. So we once had millionaires and then at a certain point in society, under my own society, we had multi-millionaires. So it just wasn't a millionaire. Now, this was a multi-millionaire. But then we came to a point where we had billionaires. 
So now if you're just a millionaire, ah, pfft, you're not rich. If you're a multimillionaire, you're not rich. Now we have billionaires. Now if you're a billionaire, you're rich. But now we have multi-billionaires. They're worth billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of money, of dollars. And where does it stop? Where does it stop? this excessive desire for money. If you think about it, how much money does a person really need in life? How much money does a person really need in life? What are you going to do with all that money? Excessive money. I'm not saying that we can't have money. Again, I'm saying it's excessive. It's excessive. Because we have this dichotomy between, say, multi-billionaires and let's just say the favelas in Brazil, where people are so hungry that they're sniffing glue because of the hunger pains in their stomachs. Think about that. Think about the dichotomy between the super rich and the super poor. And we have both. And why do we see the super rich more? Because the poor don't have the means of technology to show how they live. It takes a person like a Mother Teresa to really show the poor in our midst. So this excessive desire for money, it's part of our secularized society. Then we have, next to that, Another vice, the excessive desire for material things, as you can see on the slide there. Excessive desire for material things, what we call consumerism. That it's the mentality of consumerism that we never have enough. And the ads always want to display to us, you never have enough. You're never satisfied. You have to have this next thing, this next object. Or people say, uh, Father Anthony, why don't you update your phone? And I said, well, I like my phone. It's not updated. Why do I need to update it? And they said, well, they have the latest, greatest, you know, I, I have Samsung. They have the latest, greatest Samsung this, you know, uh, you know, Samsung 2 million or 2,000 or whatever it is, whatever number they're up to. And it's like, why do I need it? I like my little phone. Or people are always going into my car. I have a GPS from 2008. I don't know how long ago that was, 15 years. And they say, why don't you update your GPS? And I say, I like my GPS. I like the voice of my GPS. Her name is Serena. And she's English. She has a nice British accent. I know we have American accents. I love British accents. They're, they're great. She has a nice British accent. She keeps me calm on the road when I'm driving. And people say, why don't you update? And I say, I don't want to divorce Serena. She's very nice to me. Yes, we get into arguments when she recalculates, but it's okay. It's okay. Why do we need more and more and more? Think about it. Once we buy one item, we then desire another item. And once we buy that item, then we desire another item. And we, are, we keep buying, but are never satisfied. We always want more, and it will never truly make us happy. And it can lead us to the endless pursuit of materialism and take us away from the spiritual. Think about the devil's tactic here. He wants us to be so consumed with all of our material things that we don't have time for the spiritual. We don't have time for prayer. We don't have time to go to mass. We don't have time to talk with God. We don't have time for others because we're so consumed by all of the excessive things that we have. Again, I'm not saying I'm not saying that you can't have things. You, know, you need a car to get here. 
You have to have a car. That's okay. It's okay to have things. But ask yourself, do I own these things or do they own me? That was something that my novice master said in my novitiate about poverty. He said, do you own this thing or does it own you? In our novitiate, we, we had to do a chart. We had to look at all of our material things and we did a chart. On one side we put needs and the other side we said once. Our novice master had us look at all of our material things and write it down. Is this a need or is this a want? Do you need this thing or do you want this thing? It really, it really taught me that, boy, I have a lot of wants. I have a lot of wants. It taught me innovation. I have a lot of wants. And it's good to look at your closet. Look at your thing, see, mm, is this a need or a want? Is this consuming me? Is this consuming my time, my thinking? So it's one thing to look at, it's part of our society and the ads are all out there, all out there for us to accumulate more and more and more and more. And the lie about it is that you think you're going to be happy if you have more. And actually, it doesn't really make you happy because all you do is desire more. You buy a phone, it's the latest, greatest model, and you're like, oh, so excited. And then five years, you're tossing that phone out and you're buying a new phone. And when does it end? Gratitude can always help. Gratitude. Always being grateful for what you have. Another characteristic of our secularized culture, the desire for excessive pleasure. As you can see on the next slide, we have so much pleasure, what's called hedonism. The word hedonism means a desire for excess pleasure. I mean, it's not bad to desire a little pleasure in our life, I, I like wine every now and then, cheese and Italian food, and you know, it's not, it's not bad. It's when it becomes excessive. And that's our culture, it's driving us to excess. Look at all the addictions that are out there. I'll just, I'll just name some of, the, some of the big ones. Alcohol, alcoholism. Look at the alcohol addiction, alcoholism addiction. Addiction, not only in the United States, but in the world. Look at how alcoholism has destroyed marriages and destroyed families. As a, a person, because they, they just can't stop themselves. And that's where like programs like AA or rehab is really great. And it's not always the person's fault because they're dealing with other issues. But the alcohol is a way of just drowning out those issues that are already there. Drugs. Think about drugs. How huge that is. How huge in our culture, our society. People get hooked on it and they can't stop. They just can't stop by, by their own willpower. It's very difficult for a person. It does not mean that the person is bad. I don't think like someone that gets addicted to alcohol or drugs, that they're bad people. No, it's not that they're bad people. It's part of our, it's just our culture. It's our culture. Third one, this is a big one today, pornography. Pornography, it's huge, it's just growing from the internet. And people are getting addicted to it. And it's, it's just part of our culture, it's part of our internet culture. Gluttony, excessive eating of food. You think of all the fast food that's out there. And it's a temptation for many people. Many people just can't stop. And then fifth one, gambling. Get, look at all the casinos that are popping up. And some people, they just, they just can't stop. You just can't stop it. And these are good, innocent people that are just, they're getting sucked up. They're into all these addictions in our society. 
in our society and we're, it's being entrenched in our society, this excessive desire for pleasure, hedonism. That's at the root of all these addictions is this excessive desire for pleasure. Next characteristic of our secularized society, technology. Technology. I, I think that we priests don't talk enough about technology and how technology is just, it, it's, it's just overwhelming our culture. We live in a technocratic society. Even this is a live stream. It's, you know, it's being published on the internet. Uh, you think of the TV, the cell phones, the iPads, the computers, the internet. It just, it's, it's all consuming us today. And the thing is, is you need it for work. You need it for work. So it's not like we can just get by it and just, you know, toss out the cell phone because you need it for work and you need it for communication. It's, it is both good and bad. So I'm not one of these to say, ah, oh, throw out your TV, it's all bad. No, there, there's good. There's also good in it. And there's also good with the internet. But there is bad also. So we have to be truthful that it's both good and bad. And how do we deal with all this technology that, that's, that's just grappling our attention, just the texting? Pe people text me and they're like, you haven't texted me in one day. What's wrong with you? Like, well, I'm doing other things. Like, I'm hearing millions of confessions here. You know, I can't be texting in the confessional. I don't think the penitent would like that. You know, it's like, hold your horses, you know. I, I, you got other things to do. But, but we live in this kind of fast-paced, excessive information, fast-paced, fast communication world that sometimes just consumes our mind where we can't even breathe can't even be silent and breathe for a little bit. So the, these are some of the characteristics of our society. And I want to read to you from Lumen Gentium that describes a little bit of our society. This was written in the 1960s, and I think it's just as relevant today. This is from Gaudium et Spes, the document called Gaudium et Spes. It's a little bit long, but just bear with me. Today, the human race is involved in a new stage of history. Profound and rapid changes are spreading by degrees around the whole world. Triggered by the intelligence and creative energies of man, these changes recoil upon him, upon his decisions and desires, both individual and collective, and upon his manner of thinking and acting with respect to things and to people. Hence, we can already speak of a true cultural and social transformation, one which has repercussions on man's religious life as well. As happens in any crisis of growth, this transformation has brought serious difficulties in its wake. Thus, while man extends his power in every direction, he does not always succeed in subjecting it to his own welfare, striving to probe more profoundly and to the deeper recesses of his own mind, he frequently appears more unsure of himself. Gradually and more precisely, he lays bare the laws of society, only to be paralyzed by uncertainty about the direction to give it. Never has the human race enjoyed such an abundance of wealth, resources, and economic power. And yet a huge proportion of the world's citizens are still tormented by hunger and poverty while countless numbers suffer from total illiteracy. Never before has man had so keen an understanding of freedom, yet at the same time new forms of social and psychological slavery make their appearance. Although the world of today has a very vivid awareness of its unity and of how one man depends on one another in needful solidarity, it is most grievously torn and opposing into opposing camps by conflicting forces for political, social, economic, racial, and ideological disputes still continue bitterly, and with them the peril of a war which would reduce everything to ashes. 
True, there is a growing exchange of ideas, but the very words by which key concepts are expressed take on quite different meanings and diverse ideological systems. Finally, man painstakingly searches for a better world without a corresponding spiritual advancement. Influenced by such a, a variety of complexities, many of our contemporaries are kept from accurately identifying permanent values and adjusting them properly to fresh discoveries. As a result, buffeted between hope and anxiety and pressing one another with questions about the present course of events, they are burdened down with uneasiness. The same course of events leads men to look for answers Indeed, it forces them to do so. Doesn't that sound like our society? And that was written almost 60 years ago. And yet, I think it's even more true now than it was before. So how do we respond to the secularized society? What, what, what are some responses that we can give? So one thing is, there's a difference between the inner self and the outer self. We tend to look for happiness outside ourselves. We think that, we expect that this new material thing or pleasure that we indulge in will bring us ultimate happiness. We even expect other people to give us happiness. We tend to look outside the self to find our worth. So what other people think about us. We think our worth is dependent upon what other people think about us. Whereas there is a whole universe inside ourselves. What conversation do we have with ourself? Is it all about myself? Do we focus only on gratifying the body? Or do we seek the inward soul? And it's natural to want run away from ourselves may not like ourselves. It is difficult to face the self. It is much easier to gratify the self. So we escape into materialism, work, pleasure, etc. We tend to drown out the inner voice of conscience with lots of noise and busyness. I'd like to read to you from, this is from The Three Ages of the Interior Life by Father Garagu. Lagrange, and this is the section called Conversation with Oneself. And this is a conversation if, if we're egotistical, narcissistic, focused on self. This is our conversation that we can have with ourself, but it entraps us. And but Father Garagu Lagrange also states a way of getting out of the self. So th this is from his book on the three ages of the interior life. If a man is fundamentally egotistical, his intimate conversation with himself is inspired by sensuality or pride. He converses with himself about the object of his cupidity, of his envy. Finding therein sadness and death, he tries to flee from himself to live outside of himself, to divert himself in order to forget the emptiness and the nothingness of his life. In this intimate conversation of the egoist with himself, there is a certain very inferior self-knowledge and a no less inferior self-love. He is acquainted especially with the sensitive part of his soul, that part which is common to man and to the animal. Thus he has sensible joys, sensible sorrows, according as the weather is pleasant or unpleasant, as he wins money or loses it. He has desires and aversions of the same sensible order. And when he is opposed, he has moments of impatience and anger prompted by inordinate self-love. But the egoist knows little about the spiritual part of his soul, that which is common to the angel and to man. Even if he believes in the spirituality of the soul and of the higher faculties, intellect, and will, he does not live in the spiritual order. He does not, so to speak, know experimentally this higher part of himself, and he does not love it sufficiently. If he knew it, he would find in it the image of God and he would begin to love himself, not in an egotistical manner for himself, but for God. His thoughts almost always fall back on what is inferior in him. 
And though he often shows intelligence and cleverness, which may even become craftiness and cunning, his intellect, instead of rising, always inclines toward what is inferior to it. It is made to contemplate God, the supreme truth, and it often dallies in error, sometimes obstinately defending the error by every means. It has been said that if life is not on a level with thought, thought ends by descending to the level of life. All declines, and one's highest convictions gradually grow weaker. Then he goes on. The intimate conversation of the egoist with himself proceeds thus to death and is therefore not an interior life. His self-love leads him to wish to make himself the center of everything, to draw everything to himself, both persons and things. Since this is impossible, he frequently ends in disillusionment and disgust. He becomes unbearable to himself and to others and ends by hating himself because he wished to love himself excessively. At times, he ends by hating life because he desired too greatly what is inferior in it. If a man who is not in the state of grace begins to seek goodness, his intimate conversation with himself is already quite different. He converses with himself, for example, about what is necessary to live becomingly and to support his family. This at times preoccupies him greatly. He feels his weakness and the need of placing his confidence no longer in himself alone, but in God. While still in the state of mortal sin, this man may have Christian faith and hope, which subsists in us even after the loss of charity, as long as we have not sinned mortally by incredulity, despair, or presumption. When this is so, this man's intimate conversation with himself is occasionally illumined by the supernatural light of faith. Now and then he thinks of eternal life and desires it. Although this desire remains weak, he is sometimes led by a special inspiration to enter a church to pray. Finally, if this man has at least attrition for his sins and receives absolution for them, he recovers the state of grace and charity, the love of God and neighbor. Therefore, when he is alone, his intimate conversation with himself changes. He begins to love himself in a holy manner, not for himself, but for God, and to love his own for God. He begins to understand that he must pardon his enemies and love them, and to wish eternal life for them as he does for himself. Often, however, the intimate conversation of a man in the state of grace continues to be tainted with egoism, self-love, sensuality, and pride. These sins are no longer mortal in him, they are venial, but if they are repeated, they incline him to fall into a serious sin, that it is to fall back into spiritual death. Should this happen, this man tends again to flee from himself because what he finds in himself is no longer life, but death. Instead of making a salutary reflection on the subject, he may hurl himself back farther into death by casting himself into pleasure and to the satisfactions of sensuality or of pride. In a man's hours of solitude, this intimate conversation begins again in spite of everything, as if to prove to him that it cannot stop. He would like to interrupt it, yet he cannot do so. The center of the soul has an irrestrainable need which demands satisfaction. In reality, God alone can answer this need, and the only solution is straightway to take the road leading to him. The soul must converse with someone other than itself. Why? because it is not its own last end, because its end is the living God, and it cannot rest entirely except in him. As St. Augustine puts it, our heart is restless until it reposeth in thee. Isn't that great? So we all have the struggle with inside ourselves. With inside, egoism wants to take over. Our self wants to take over. But if we are open in that conversation with ourselves, which we cannot escape when we're alone, when we're in solitude, if we are open, then it is in the silence of our hearts that God speaks to us. God speaks to us tenderly of our worth, dignity, and value as a human being, that we are created in the image and likeness of God, and that God loves us even when we are sinners, and yes, we are not worthy of God's love, but divine mercy makes us worthy 
and restores our interior image. And we can only love ourselves when we allow divine mercy into our souls. Then we will escape less into what the secularized world offers us. Do you see all these things in the secularized world? That they're all escapes from ourself. From ourself. We don't want to face ourselves. And many people don't like themselves. Maybe they hate themselves. Well, I always tell people, take eyes off self, put the eyes on Jesus. Eyes on divine mercy. Because if you look at yourself, yes, you may be discouraged at what you see. But that's where we take our eyes off ourself, start conversing with God interiorly, and God will raise you up. God will restore you. God will show you your worth, your dignity, your value. Then you won't need to escape into anything that the secularized world offers us. So now, how do, again, the question, how do we live holiness in a secularized world? So, First of all, we cannot live holiness in the secular society without grace. Grace is a participation in divine life. There is a lot of self-help out there. And it's the old American philosophy, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You ever hear that? I heard it when I was there. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But it does not work in a secular society. Our bootstraps will fall down. If we try to do it on our own, bootstraps will fall down. The secular world is like a flood which sweeps everything in its path. Grace is the higher power we need to keep us from drowning in the flood of sin and ideologies contrary to Christianity. So now, how do we we get grace? How do we do it? So the first is prayer. Brother Mark is going to show an image of prayer. Prayer. Prayer is our intimate conversation with God. What prayers do we pray? The rosary. The rosary. Pray the prayer of the rosary. The Blessed Mother is very powerful. She will obtain the grace of God for us. The chaplet of divine mercy. Pray the chaplet. It's an atonement prayer for our sins. So instead of despairing because of your sins, pray the chaplet to atone for your sins. See that? So if we focus on our sins and our worthlessness, and we don't focus on Jesus, yes, we're going to remain drowned in there. But if we start focusing on Jesus and say, Jesus, I give you all these sins, and we're making atonement for the sins, we're asking for God's grace to come down enter our souls. Meditation on the passion of Christ. Many of the saints said that that every temptation can be averted if we meditate on the passion of Christ. That's how powerful the passion of Christ is. What's another way that we can live in holiness? Fasting, penance, as you see on the slide. There's many things that are craving our attention in our society today. And we, we, need to, we need to give some things up. Lent is good to give up. Not all food, but give up some food. Uh, give up alcohol, cigarettes, drugs. Give up technology. Have limits on it. Give up material goods. We need to have limits on certain things, even to fast, because, because it will consume us. It will literally consume us, our every attention. It will consume us if we don't fast, if we don't put forth the effort. The sacraments. Sacraments are very important for living the spiritual life. Two frequent sacraments, confession and holy communion. Go to confession as often as you need it. Why? Because our secular society is just, it's just in our face with vices all the time, all the time all the time. So we may have to go to confession all the time, all the time, all the time. But you're never going to tire God out from forgiving you. God, he never tires of forgiving us. He never tires 
of giving us mercy, even when he sees that we're struggling to live holiness and we keep falling. God's grace is there. Holy communion. Jesus gives us himself, his body, blood, soul, and divinity, and holy communion. That's where we get God's grace to, to live a new life, to transform us. Don't ever receive holy communion and walk out the door. Don't ever be ungrateful when you receive holy communion. Always, when you receive holy communion, always say, thank you, Jesus. Just say that. Just say, thank you, Jesus. And if that's all you say, Jesus is pleased. He'll pour out his graces when you give gratitude. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for holy communion. Don't walk out. Don't walk out because you just received the grace that you need to help you in the secular society. There's two neglected sacraments in the church right now. Confirmation and anointing of the sick. When I say confirmation, people are receiving confirmation, but they're not invoking the power of the Holy Spirit to help them. You receive confirmation, it's like, oh, I just go on with my everyday life. We all invoke the power. Notice it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God to help us in the secularized society. Anointing of the sick is being neglected. How many sick people there are out there that need the anointing of the sick, especially for the dying, especially that grace that they need for leaving this life? And then there are two important sacraments in decline today. Baptism and matrimony are in decline. People are not baptizing their children. So they're not receiving the grace that they need to respond to the secular society. If you're wondering, well, why is my child like this? Well, you never baptize your child. That's why your child is like that. The child doesn't have the grace that, that he or she needs when they become adolescents and teenagers to respond to this secular culture. And matrimony is grace and the sacrament of matrimony to keep couples together. So what, what are some other ways that we can grow in our grace? So the first thing that we have to realize is that even though we say it's a secular culture, you see things out there, behind all that, there's a spiritual war going on. Behind all that, there are demons that are attacking you, and there are angels that are helping you. So there's a whole spiritual war around us. So if we have a spiritual war, then we need spiritual weapons. And what are some spiritual weapons in the next slide? Holy water. Holy water is very powerful. Get holy water. Uh, exercise holy water, I, I think is greater, but even if you can't get exercise holy water, get not exercise holy water, get holy water, sprinkle it all around. Because there's demons around you, you need to sprinkle that. Holy salt. Sprinkle holy salt all on your home. You know, even with your children, like if your children are going astray or grandchildren, get holy salt. And if you're the cook, put holy salt in the food. They'll eat it whether they like it or, you know, they don't even know. Put it in the food. You have to salt your food. So why not make it holy salt? Salt your food with holy salt. Holy oil, holy oil, very powerful, symbol of anointing of the Spirit. Have blessed crucifixes in your home or around you, statues, images, rosaries, scapulars, medals, necklaces, bracelets, etc., etc. Always make sure that they're blessed. Blessed candles, you can have candles in your home, just don't burn down your home. Have candles, just don't burn down your home. There are powerful sacramentals. Blessed palms from Palm Sunday. Don't throw them out. Keep those blessed palms because they are powerful protection against demons. The Easter vigil candles, very powerful. Very powerful. The Easter vigil holy water, very powerful. Get some Easter vigil holy water. Drink it if you have to. If you're being attacked, drink it. You can drink holy water, and no one says you can't drink it. So the, these are concrete 
means and ways to help us to receive that grace that we need to respond to the secular society. But there are also virtues that we need. So virtues is not talked about in our society. You'll hear a lot about the vices, but you won't even hear about the virtues. So first we need to know what the virtues are in order to practice them. So if you don't even know what the virtues are, how can you practice them? So the first virtue, and you, if you ever heard my homilies, I emphasize this, I overemphasize it, and I will still overemphasize it. Humility. Humility. Humility is the foundation of the virtues. Humility helps us to see ourselves as we are, as sinners, but who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Pride wants us to escape from ourselves and to all kinds of secular pursuits, be it money, work, sports, food, sex, etc. Humility is the virtue which grounds us. Dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. That's what we heard at Ash Wednesday. It keeps us real. Think about it. Who wants to hear a person only talking about themselves? You ever, you ever go in conversation with that? And all the person is doing is boasting and bragging about themselves. Me, myself, and I. Isn't that a boring conversation? So boring. That's what pride does. Pride does. It's all about me. Humility, it's all about dying to yourself. It's all about the other person. It is better to show a real face on yourself rather than a mask. The secular culture wants us to exalt the self, but rather it is better to humble the self. As Jesus said, he who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Pride wears a mask of virtue. Humility strips off the mask of virtue. We acknowledge that we are sinners and that we need God's grace and mercy. Humility is the foundation of all are the virtues. All the virtues grow from humility. I'd like to show you this chart. We're going to put it up on the live stream, but also I gave people here this chart right here. This is a chart about the different virtues here. And this is a, it's a pillar. The virtues are like a pillar to help us. That's why I like this chart. As at the bottom, is Christ. Christ is our rock. We have to be firmly established in the rock. Our house has to be built on rock. Then you see humility down here. Humility is the foundation of all the virtues. Why do I emphasize humility? Notice that take humility out and the whole structure falls. So you have to have humility for the other virtues to grow. You'll notice two pillars here. They're faith and hope. So faith and hope are two pillars that hold up the structure. Charity is the arch of the structure. And then you'll notice that there's a doorway, which is the four moral virtues. Prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. And then you'll see the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that also aid these virtues. You see the three lamps, the gift of wisdom, the gift of understanding, and the gift of knowledge, which helps charity, faith, and hope. You'll see gift of counsel, gift of piety, gift of fortitude, and gift of fear, which also helps the four moral virtues. So let's go into these virtues, how they can help us in our secular society. First of all, faith. Faith is the virtue to believe in God. In other words, to believe in a higher power than yourself as they teach in the 12 steps of AA. You have to believe in a higher power, faith, or else the secular world will consume you with an addiction. The gift of understanding increases faith, faith-seeking understanding. The more we understand, the more it can help our faith. Next virtue is hope. Hope is the virtue to desire the mercy and promises of God. If our hope is in the here and the now, we will be disappointed. That's what secular society presents us. 
only the here and the now. Hope leads us to something greater than the here and the now, something beyond this world and greater than this world. It is a great virtue for those who have chronic suffering. In the next world, heaven, there is no pain, no illness, no suffering, only joy and ecstasy. And the gift of knowledge helps hope. The more we know God, the more we want to be with him. And then charity is the last of the theological virtues. Charity is the virtue to love God above everything else and our neighbor as ourselves. It is the crown of all the virtues. To be loved and to love is the fulfillment of all our desires. We are most like God when we love. The gift of wisdom increases charity because wisdom helps us to desire spiritual things and raises us above this earth. Now, the four moral virtues, four moral virtues are prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Prudence guides us to make the right decisions, especially in our secular society. Have you ever heard the phrase, the near occasion of sin? Near occasion of sin. This is the virtue that helps us not to touch that hot stove. You ever hear a parent, do not touch that hot stove. The parent is giving counsel to the child and the child can either make the decision, do I touch it, do I not? Do I touch it, do I not? When it touches it, be burned and can learn from that. This, is the, this virtue helps us make right decisions, such as it is time to go to bed. I am not going to watch more TV, go on the internet, touch that bottle, grab that bag of chips. I am going to bed. See that? That's a prudent decision. We're deliberating. What should I do? What should, should I go to bed? Should I stay up? The gift of counsel helps prudence especially in making important decisions. The next virtue, justice. The virtue that gives God his due. Example, praying the rosary and not talking yourself out of praying, but praying. Or another example, not eating meat on Friday. And you could say, well, it's just a little meat. It won't hurt anyone. See that? See how we sometimes justify our actions, and we lose the virtue. The gift of piety helps justice and that it makes us more consistent and fervent in our prayers. Fortitude. Fortitude is the virtue that endures suffering. It's not courage. People would think it's courage. Courage is active. Fortitude is passive. Fortitude, for example, of fortitude, you're standing up for your Catholic faith at a school board meeting. Other people attack you, they ostracize you, they call you all kinds of names. You need fortitude to endure that suffering. The gift of fortitude, there's a gift of fortitude that will help us with the virtue of fortitude, especially when we have to endure long and painful suffering, such as maybe a Christian who's in a prison camp right now, and they have to endure long suffering, the bishop who's in Nicaragua, who's, who's in a house prison, he needs a special gift of fortitude to help him right now, to stand up for his faith. And then finally, the fourth virtue, temperance. Temperance means to temper something, that is moderation. You ever hear of moderation in all things? Don't go to too much excess, don't go to too much deficiency. Our secular culture teaches people to gratify all their sensual desires without any moderation. They say, be free without any constraints or laws. This is your freedom. This is your choice, your freedom. And our freedom leads only to slavery. We become slaves of sin. We become addicts of our desires. As we give into it more, and more and more we find we can't escape from it because it begins to consume us. Temperance puts the leash on the wild dog. You ever meet a wild dog? And if no leash, 
then the dog will bite you. So if you have a wild dog, if you don't have a leash, the dog will bite you. If you have a leash, the dog may be barking, but he won't bite you. So dogs can do a lot of barking, but if they're on a leash, they will not bite you. The gift of the fear of God aids temperance and that we have a respect and awe of God's holiness and beauty, respect for ourselves that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. So each of these virtues will help us to achieve holiness. Again, you can't see the virtues. You have to, you have to practice them in life. Our age calls for new saints, that is new paths to holiness in a different society than ages past. The world is different, but the virtues are the same. Our holiness will require great grace and effort. We may need to be very creative to practice virtue in our secular society. The sin in our secular society is greater than ever before, but that means the virtue to overcome that sin will also be greater. So if you overcome a sin in our secular society, the virtue will be greater because the sin is also greater. You may need to practice not just virtue, but heroic virtue in our secularized society. And it may seem impossible, but our God is a God of the impossible. We may have to be like Rocky in our secularized society, being knocked down often, but rising back up every time. And if some of you are saying, who is Rocky? That's a movie, watch Rocky. If you haven't watched the movie Rocky, watch it. It's about a boxer, you know, and he's against Apollo Creed. Apollo Creed keeps knocking him down and he keeps getting up and he keeps knocking him down and he keeps getting up. That's the way we have to be in our secular society. We're gonna be beaten up and bruised like Rocky, but we may still come out a winner. The holiness of this age will be greater. There will be new St. Augustines. If you struggle to live your faith in the secular society, have hope. You may be the next saint. Grace will help us to overcome our sins. For as it says in the Bible, where sin has abounded, grace has abounded all the more. Trust in God's mercy. His mercy and his grace are great, and God will help us every step of the way on our journey toward holiness. Thank you for attending the live stream talk today. I wish you God's blessings upon you and your loved ones. Now I'd like to give you my blessing at the end of this talk. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you all. God bless you. Hell, too, is divided into various and countless circles. The lower the circle, the heavier the torment. The condemned soul knows about all the greatness, the power, and the beauty of God, and is also aware that it will never see him. It knows that its suffering is eternal, and that nothing can soothe or alleviate it. It is burned by an endless fire of desire and longing for happiness that will never again be experienced. And this fire devours and digests the condemned soul, but never destroys it completely. The condemned soul has a full understanding of its own loss and of the righteousness of the punishment it suffers. It cannot love God, though it knows of his power and perfection. It cannot feel either repentance or regret, because these feelings would relieve the souls and give the impression that it is paying off a debt to God given by his love. However, only negative feelings are available, despair, pain, weakness, abandonment, and most of all, constant, unlimited hate for oneself and for everything.
whoever consciously rejected God during his lifetime will be rejected by him after death. The soul will go into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. There is no more salvation or return from there.